So hi everybody, it's Professor Spark here and I'm very grateful today to be joined by Professor Kat Gutierrez who's a history professor here at UCSC. But before that, she worked as a community health um, worker and um, organizer and then went into policy in commu community health, public health uh, and then went on to become a professor of history and um, along the way she's become very interested in questions of representation, the politics of representation and she's currently organizing a big project called Watsonville in the Heart uh, which is about um, recreating and remembering the history of Filipino farm workers uh, in the Pajaro Valley. So Professor Gutierrez, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, and, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to be able to turn to you for some advice. And the, the main um, question I want to pose at the outset is what is your advice for students who are using photography to document health challenges or health action opportunities or their own health service work? Mm. This is a good question and I think I'm going to go at it from a historian's perspective uh -huh. if that's okay. Um, you know, I have to say that we see photographs all the time when we go into archives. Archives are typically the places where we will look for historical documentation to kind of give us the stuff to write history. Photographs tend to be a part of that mm -hmm. and I can't tell you enough how hard it is, even maybe even painful it is, when we come across a photograph that just doesn't have very much detail. Um, it doesn't have the names of people in the photograph. We know a little about the location or the time when the photograph was taken, um, or even just the meanings behind it and what it meant for the person who was either taking the photo or who was actually the photographic subject. So I would say for me, one of the most important bits of information I could provide for students is look, try to get the basics and make sure you collect them well. Everything from the names of the people that you're photographing to the location where you're taking that photograph the time and date, keep that. Um, and then also understand the context around that photograph too. If you can take notes around that, you know, who were you talking to to let this photograph happen? What exactly was happening in this photograph that transpired? And then even if, what did it mean to you? I think this is the kind of stuff that actually makes for really, really good documentation. Oh, that's great. And that gets into one of the other uh, topics I wanted to talk about with you, because I know you're really interested in talking to the subjects and not it being a passive relationship with the photograph subject, but instead a, a co-creative um, relationship. And could you talk a little bit more about some of your strategies for creating a co-creative photographic relationship? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, so Watson Villas in the Heart is this project that I'm a part of. And I have to say, one of the hugest things that we stick to is this notion of co-creation. It's the idea that whomever we're working with in the community is co-creating the materials that are coming out on that community. So as you had introduced, we're interested in um, the histories of Filipino Americans in the Pajaro Valley. We're talking to the descendants of the very first migrant wave of Filipinos to arrive to the valley. Um, many of these people are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, mm -hmm. and we see them as co-creators in this work, meaning the history that we're gonna be writing, the archives that we're developing on them, the photographs that we're either retaking with them or collecting are really kind of coming through their voices and hands to let us know what's important to them. And I say all of this because as someone who studied history, especially colonial history, I can't tell you enough how common it is, again, to see photographs and materials that were actually probably extracted from a community without much explanation or reason, um, and to such an extent that we might have tons and tons of photographs, but they almost start to blur into each other in this kind of extractive lens. Mm -hmm. And I think co-creation is just one step in pushing against that. It's not perfect. There are always gonna be power and imbalances, but to the best that we can, we make sure that we're really going for co-creation. Do you wanna talk about any of the challenges that do come up? Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, you know, this is really important for even students to know. You will always have a particular essence of power coming yeah. from and being affiliated with a university, yeah. whether you're a professor, whether you're a student working in a particular class, or whether you're one of our undergraduate researchers. We know that the university has been a place long understood to be heavily resourced, um, deeply hierarchical, and with a strained relationship to community members. 
And so if we think with that lens and understand that that's something that we're trying to work against, we know that we're also being very mindful of our position when we go into communities. The other sense is, you know, when you're on the ground, people just have very different visions. I mean, I think this is like the beauty of community work and the, the difficulty of it too, you know, and as someone who used to do community health education and used to organize, you know, many, many communities of folks, um, you just learn that a difference of opinion and disagreement is par for the course. And I think to the best that we can, when we work with a lot of different folks on our Watsonville is in the Heart project, we understand that we have these differences of opinion. We try to reach consensus as much as possible. We also admit when we can't. Mm -hmm. And so if there are ever instances where, you know, someone is very unsatisfied with the way that we're working, we really heed their call and we really mold our vision to the best that we can too around how our community is seeing things play out, for instance, with the history that we're writing. Wow. So to pick up on a couple of words you've used, um, yeah. earlier on you used the word retaking and then you just used the words uh, play out. And um, it makes me think of people playing out um, older scenes, which I understand is one of the things that you're, is one of your strategies. Um, so can you talk us through a little bit how you go about doing one of these retakings of an old photograph and yeah. what it involves? Sure, sure, sure. So um, this is a very cool project um, that was really born out of one of our graduate students and now an undergraduate who's been helping her for quite some time now. We're actually creating an interactive map. Wow. Um, and so this interactive map is doing two things. Um, first, it's tracking the movement of the 1930 anti-Filipino Watsonville race riots. What most people know, at least what we hope, is that Watsonville and the place of Filipinos in that community really came about into kind of the public knowledge and consciousness around these riots that had happened in 1930. Um, to date, no one really knows how these riots moved. It was five days of violence and mobbing, and we're trying to track how those rioters were moving over that time. But the second element of the map is to actually demonstrate community resilience. How did Filipinos, in spite of this really insistent moment of um, exclusion, um, that was really also part of a larger atmosphere of racial inequity during the time, this is around 1930, how did they, in spite of all that, still forge a community over decades? And so one of the elements of that map is to include re-photographs of particular locations and people um, that is so cool. Thank you. That were pretty um, important to this community. Yeah, I see. So like I had mentioned, um, we've been working with the descendants of this first wave of Filipino migrants that came in the 1910s and the 1920s. That first wave is, is long past, but their children have been really great. And so what we've been doing is actually working with their family photos to restage them um, and to re-photograph them in these places that were meaningful, heartfelt, um, and important to members of the community. So can I show you? Yeah, please. Yeah. So um, might not catch it on the camera, but this is an old photograph um, from the Diocampo family. Um, here is uh, Skippy Diocampo, who is the father to these three children. They're on a tractor, actually on Skippy's land um, out in northern Monterey County in the Pajaro Valley. And the children are posing with the, with the tractor as though they're going to ride it. Um, which we found to be really a charming photo, by the way. Um, and what's very, very cool is that one of the children who's in the photograph, actually two of them, actually all of them, have been really great participants in this project. And so to re-photograph this, we actually went to the original property, which has since been inherited by um, the son. Uh, this is Paul Diocampo, who actually works here at UCSC. Oh, right. um, and his sister, Antoinette diocampo Lechtenberg. And we got them back on the land um, and we tried to kind of arrange, you know, have them stand where we think this photograph had originally been taken. It's pretty hard work because the landscapes change. <laughs> the tree line really shifts. Yeah. That tractor we can't find. It's kind of long gone. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been going out mm -hmm. with undergraduate and graduate student researchers to stage photographs like these and to kind of re-enliven the fact that these family photographs exist and they can capture where these children are now. And then on your map, the, you'll click on the site and the photograph will come up. Is that one of the things yes. that will happen? Yeah, and so that's, folks can actually see kind of a then and now. 
we're hoping yeah. that there can be some sort of, you know, kind of scurly thing that can show kind of how something has shifted from the moment that it was taken maybe in the archive, this black and white photo, to 2023 yeah. when we're retaking the photos. It's so neat because maps are so often the tools of colonial conquest, right? Mapping resources for extraction and so forth. And oh, instead, yeah. you're turning it around and saying we can reuse the map to tell the story of the people who lived here and were impacted by these, you know, um, persecutions, you know, mm -hmm. amazing. Um, well, I guess one question um, that is a bit more philosophical um, that comes up with this, maybe it's a sort of an imponderable, I don't know, you, you probably have some perspective on, is, you know, what, what is authentic in the end uh, when we do this kind of work? Because I can see in a way, it seems very authentic to engage people who, whose lives the history has shaped, you know, in sort of retelling the story. I mean, what's more authentic than that? And yet some people say, well, it's not the original photograph, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, you know, what's your perspective on authenticity? Oh, gosh. Um, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think as a historian at this point in my career, and maybe if I'm taking a critical standpoint, you know, that's really informed by other feminist scholars who've really thought about what it means to have certain source material or to write certain histories, is I just don't think there's one authoritative thing. So I think the question of authenticity is, is kind of a moot question because that just plays into the idea that there is such yeah. a thing as authenticity, when in fact, you know, this source is going to be just as important to the community members and as this source at some point down the line for various reasons and for different reasons, right? And so while we might value this one for being old, you know, and maybe taken by a different hand, this one might come out in the future as being a primary source that's important to a different narrative that's yet to be written. And I think that's the case with a lot of source material. And I think especially, you know, this problem of authenticity comes into play when, you know, we think of like the official narratives or, you know, state-run archives or institutional archives versus the ones we think that are you know the family members that we work with have been creating and keeping all this whole time you right. know the very scrapbooks that they hold are actually kind of composing the material that we're now using in the archive we're creating with and for them so yeah sorry to yeah now that really the question. that really resonates completely and authenticity is something that we need to question because it's often aligned with these um documents of official them. Right, you know, the, has the imprimatur uh, of um, dominant powers, or uh, and, and it doesn't do justice to the voices of ordinary people. Sure, sure, and I mean, and you know, you could have a source that's like a forgery of a letter, you know, and someone yeah. might say, well, that's not the authentic source. Well, I think, you know, sure, and yet you can also kind of still have a larger conversation on like what forgery entails, and you know, comparing these sources against one another is still that kind of work. And I think that's, you know, a slippage that goes into a very different realm. But for the sources that we think about, you know, I think we really try to value what we have. Right. Yeah. And it's situated and it's relational. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really inspiring to me. And I think it's going to be very inspiring to many students. So thanks for sharing those pieces of advice with us. And um, thanks for all your time. I, I really got so much out of it. Thank you. Oh, thank you.